There's been a lot of Justice League movies made over the years. And being as such, even a super fan like me hasn't seen all of them. And this was one of the many that I haven't. Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. And being as there's a Crisis on Infinite Earths movie coming up, I thought now would probably be the ideal time to check it out. The Justice League are taken to an alternate Earth where the would-be Deathstroke is made president. The Justice League is run by Lex Luthor and Joker counterpart the Jester, and the Super Friends are rogues called the Crime Syndicate, who rule over the Earth and do as they please. This world is not the one that our heroes know, and it's not one that we as fans know either. This movie is a one-off tale that pits the Justice League against other world equivalents. It's sort of like Injustice, but as opposed to giving audiences the traditional heroes now turned villain, it gave us villainous near-identical counterparts. Characters who essentially serve as anti-stand-ins for our heroes. The tale is kind of refreshing. It does new and original things with the famous and familiar characters, but doesn't discredit the source by having the tale be set elsewhere. These are not the heroes and villains that we know. They're just characters that kind of remind us of them. The story juxtaposes these variants with the originals who are also front and center. Though I appreciate that this story doesn't condense it down to character versus counterpart. Instead, it divides the two teams up fairly evenly, with some heroes coming across their negatives and others never meeting their other. It would have been very easy to bring this into one-note territory, but instead the story feels a lot more fluid and less forced. In Time of Crisis on an Alternate Universe, hero Lex Luthor and the Jester steal a device that could lead to the demise of the DC multiverse. Luthor escapes to the movie's main Earth, where he teams up with that Earth's Justice League in the hopes of stopping the power's reign of terror. The team is hesitant about involving themselves in matters outside of their own Earth, but the majority decide that true justice doesn't have a jurisdiction. Most of the League follows Luther to this bad guy infested Earth where they encounter their worser halves. And that's when worlds collide, continually. The villainous Justice League consists of its leader, a mafia-made Superman named Ultraman, who is a super-powered Don that rules over the Syndicate with an iron fist a dominatrix mistress Wonder Woman named Superwoman, uh, no relation. Uh, what confuses me the most about her is that somehow this is the one without a lasso. You got Sex Pistols Flash Johnny Quickie, who replaces the Flash's sarcasm and selfless nature with his own obnoxious selfish behavior. Most importantly, you have nihilistic Batman Owlman, who has all the intellect, abilities, and capabilities of the Dark Knight, but no sense of compassion or hope. Owlman has no care for anything, only finding comfort in the absence of everything. And then there's a couple others who honestly are barely touched upon and you can't really get a read for. They all have big personalities and hardly resemble the characters that they themselves resemble. They also constantly clash and collide. Despite their formation, there's no friendships amongst the team. After all, there's no honor amongst thieves. When team members pass on, the subject is passed on. It's clear that they're not really friends, they're strictly co-workers. While they all have a common goal, team members have their own specific secret game plans, some counteractive to the team's agendas. While the Syndicate thinks it's utilizing an energy blast to hold the government hostage in their own country, in actuality, Owlman and Superwoman plot the end of everything, destroying not just the two titular Earths, but every Earth in existence, and every Earth that could ever exist. You see, upon learning that the multiverse is made up of individual choices made by its own inhabitants, Owlman decides that nothing matters. Everything is meaningless because everything has already happened somehow, somewhere, in some universe. In his mind, ultimately the only choice that truly matters is the choice to end all existence on every Earth. Which, you know, is sort of a big deal. The title does sort of make the whole ordeal seem a little bit more minor league comparatively, at least in comparison to other mainstream major stories like Crisis on Infinite Earths. But the fate of the entire universe, and, and not just the universe, but every universe, everything that has ever existed and everything that could ever exist being put in danger, that does kind of extend past just these two Earths. The movie's title is sort of shortchanging the serious threat, the team are mostly well put together and well played. There's some similarity between them and their mainline counterparts, but they're also not entirely tied down to those characters. 
I don't think any of the crime syndicate are bad, outside of their allegiance, of course. If anything, maybe some members are a little bit forgettable or just not of interest. Hawkgirl and Martian Manhunter's equivalents are killed off in the opening before making an impression. Johnny Quick is annoying, but is made that way intentionally, and I think the actor does a good job at being awful. It's clearly an intentional choice. Ultraman is portrayed as being the head of a mafia-like family. The depiction is fairly brief and stereotypical, but it's fine, if not just a bit simple. The real people of note is the twisted twosome of Owlman and Superwoman, for reasons that I'll get into in a little bit. The Syndicate is portrayed in a manner that sets them up to be the Big Bad Justice League. But their unique union is completely changed. Whereas the Justice League were assembled with a sense of law enforcement, the crime syndicate was formed in the vein of mafia mentality, with the syndicate being showcased as a criminal organization that deals out powers to their main men. The particular route that they went helps set the story apart from story sound-alikes like the later Injustice and the earlier Justice Lords episode from the Justice League cartoon. Although, interestingly enough, this movie did have origins set in that continuity. This movie was originally pitched and attempted to be produced as a bridge between Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. And that's why in its infancy, the project was titled Justice League Worlds Collide. Though some elements of its origins still linger in the plot. For starters, the team is down a member as Hawkgirl left the team at the end of the Justice League cartoon. The story ends with Wonder Woman boarding Owlman's invisible jet, which in Justice League Unlimited is introduced and shown to be her own invisible jet, something she didn't have in the previous cartoon. The League is also putting together a new watchtower following the events of the Justice League finale. Teleporters were being tested at the time, which were not a fixture of the original series, but would become a part of the show in the later half of its run. I think the inclusion of latter Series B team members could definitely be seen as an introduction to the extension of the team. But I think the biggest tell here is The Flash, who more than anyone else on the team seems to more closely resemble his TV show counterpart. Not only is he depicted the same, but the design is almost identical. I get that it's the same character, but you wouldn't necessarily mistake this Batman for being that Batman, nor this Wonder Woman for being that Wonder Woman. However, if you put these two Wally West side by side, it might take one a minute or two to realize which one is which. Most importantly though, the atmosphere seems to very much be the same. Though the voice actors didn't return and a different animation style was used, this still felt like the Justice League series in terms of the way the characters were written and betrayed. This movie feels very DCAU adjacent. However, there are clear contradictions to this being a potential sequel to the first show and prequel to the follow-up. Most notably being that Green Lantern in this film is clearly Hal Jordan, while the Green Lantern in the show has always been Jon Stewart. Well, except for that one time. Which makes me wonder if there was ever a plan in place to have this be the Justice Lords universe, just for the fact that the stories were so similar as is. Though I guess that wouldn't make much sense, considering how that story had originally ended. But as it turns out, this movie also has ties to a completely different DC project. So here's something I didn't know until I researched this. I didn't know that this movie was actually a prequel to later film Justice League Doom, a film which I've already covered here on the channel. What's most confusing to me is that these two stories could follow each other, but it almost seems like these stories were made on parallel planets. There's a lot that binds the two together, but there's also plenty that separate them. Talking about the two is a real compare-contrast situation. The character models used in both are clearly the same, no giant alterations are made there, but next to none of the same voice actors return to their roles, instead being replaced by some of the most famous actors in those respective roles. They also use some of the same music tracks, though I wouldn't necessarily call that branching continuity. The Danny Elfman score has been recycled several times over in several unrelated Batman projects over the years, from Lego Batman to the non-Zack Snyder Justice League. But the obvious intent at continuity is made when footage from this movie is recycled at the beginning of Justice League Doom. So this is a real identity crisis on two movies. Still, there's so much to love about this movie. Even the opening credits are worth sitting through, as they provide unique visuals that explain the movie's premise without actually articulating anything. The intro alone is worth the watch. 
The fights, as always, are well choreographed, and it's fun watching these worlds collide. The story is well told, and I would rank it above those other Elseworld crossover stories that I've listed before. There's a lot of subtle setup with perfect payoff. Like, for example, at the beginning of the movie, the Flash gets upset with Bruce for using technology on him without knowing the risks. And he's under the impression that Bruce either doesn't like him, doesn't respect him, or doesn't care about his well-being. Only for him to be completely proven wrong in the climax of the film, when Batman stops the Flash from taking a risk by appealing to the ego of Johnny Quick, allowing him to unknowingly sacrifice himself to save the multiverse. Batman doesn't kill in the movie, but he does, however, lead to several deaths intentionally. In most circumstances, I would probably say that this is a contradiction of the character, as Batman believes every life is worth saving, even the ones most might not think are worth saving. However, given the fact that the fate of the universe and, well, all universes really were at hand, I think that's a burden he'd be willing to bear. He wouldn't break his rule directly, but I think in this unique circumstance he'd probably bend. He didn't kill the members of the crime syndicate, but he was willing to knowingly step aside and let them inadvertently kill themselves. With assistance. Even something simple like the appearance of a jet means something by the finale. Owlman's jet at first is shown to be some Batwing alternative, but it winds up getting stuck in chameleon mode and is then repurposed as Wonder Woman's invisible jet. Yeah, they somehow managed to make that seem plausible and valid. If that's not DCAU, then I don't know what is. We're talking about the people who gave Ace the Bathound a brand new lease on life. They even tried their hand at Batmite for a millisecond. Superwoman threatens to send Batman to a cold, ice planet where he'll starve or freeze to death, only for Batman to take her up on her offer and send her boyfriend and his world-ending bomb to that same place. What I appreciate about this movie is that it wasn't afraid to take some risks, whether that meant doing something unexpected, like setting up a romance between Martian Manhunter and the President's daughter, who I think is Rose Wilson? or going into some rather dark or otherwise rough territories. There are some surprisingly brutal moments in here, like the Flash leaving a woman to drown to death. He just picks up Black Canary, runs her to the middle of the ocean, drops her, and then takes off. We don't even know that she can swim. It certainly doesn't look like she can. He just leaves her struggling and resumes his hero work. And that's the last time we ever see that character. And just a reminder, this Flash is the good one. When Batman rejects Superwoman's advances, she breaks his ribs by simply pushing into his ribcage. And then Batman tricks her into consuming what she thinks is a smoke bomb to disguise his escape, but in actuality is... Anesthetic gas. The movie also gets very philosophical at one point, quoting Nietzsche. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. We both looked into the abyss. But when it looked back at us, you blinked. And I was not expecting that here. It's like a wise man once said, battle not with monsters, lest you become a monster. And I've seen now what I would have to become to stop men like him. I know now what I must become. For as great as this movie is, it does have a couple of flaws. The voice acting alone is all over the place. You have some real quality performances, and then you have some real low quality performances. Mark Harmon has the perfect voice for Superman. It just feels right for his character, and a lot of his performance sounds pretty great. It sort of sounds like he has a slight southern drawl, which works well given Superman's earthly upbringing. I'm surprised I haven't heard this performance talked about more, because as far as I'm concerned, Mark Harmon is up there with the best of them. Fair enough. But we're talking about millions of people. We can't just turn our backs. We have to go. Are you going to stay here and watch over us forever? Obviously not. But we can stop them right now. Put an end to their hold over you. You're from a parallel Earth. How could you possibly know that? Your internal organs are reversed. Your heart is on the wrong side. Sir, I stand up to guys more powerful than I am all the time. You can do the same. Jonathan Adams makes for a really good Martian Manhunter. At first, I actually thought this role was being portrayed by Carl Lubley, the actor from the Justice League shows. It feels very much in the same vein, and it's of the same quality. It's somehow both sage-like in nature, but is unnurtured and unsure of the surroundings at all times. 
That may sound like a contradiction, but I assure you it's accurate. He sounds and acts the way that you think he would. I also appreciate this look because it reminds me of the Martian Manhunter design from the JLA comics I used to read. I've read his mind. He's telling the truth. Regardless, we have a responsibility to the millions of people being oppressed on his world. I can grow into it. Chris Noth plays Lex Luthor with the cunning and charm that you'd expect, minus his malice nature. It's really good word. But then you have Billy Baldwin as Batman, and no thank you. What's interesting about this is that apparently Billy was in the running for the role several times in the past, being considered for the part in both Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, and all I can say is, man, I'm really glad they reconsidered back then. I, I wish they would have known enough to do it a third time, though. His voice doesn't fit the character, and it especially doesn't fit the character model. He's unlike any Batman I've already heard, or any Batman I'd ever want to hear. And he's top built. He's the star of the movie. I want to make it clear, I'm not saying Billy Baldwin is a bad voice actor or a bad actor by any means. He has his moments. I'm saying Billy Baldwin's voice was bad for Batman. As of right now, I think this actually might be my least favorite Batman. Actually, you know what? Th that's misleading. I think this might be my most hated Batman. I'm pretty confident in saying that. If there's one worse, let me know in the comment section below. George Clooney not including it. I'm glad you agree. I've been thinking about a membership drive. Not this time. Why not? We've got too much on our plate right here. What was so valuable that the crime syndicate would cross dimensions to get it? Careful, Aquaman. They're stronger than you are. That remains to be seen. Now, in contrast to that, James Woods is an interesting choice for Owlman. I don't think he's someone I would have necessarily thought for the role, because I think if I was trying to cast Owlman, I'd be looking for a Batman prototype. After all, the character is essentially anti-Batman. But I think his voice fits perfectly. As always, he makes for a good villain. He captures the same stoicism and cynicism that you'd find in a Batman performance, but delivers his material in such a menacing manner. He's a stone-faced psycho whose one-track mind could mean the end of everything. I think I'm most upset that we'll never get to see this version of Owlman again because he is so perfectly frightening, and honestly is the highlight of the whole movie. This role gives us insight to what a threat Batman could be should he ever go rogue. The design's not bad either. Actually, it's probably one of the coolest looks for an alternate Batman that I've ever seen. You're insane. Does it really matter? There are alternate versions of me that you would find quite charming. You must have been a good man once. No, not good, never good. Every decision we make is meaningless or nothing, less than nothing. Once completed, the QED will give us life and death power over the entire planet. Your tactics, they all scream of outrage, despair, vengeance. Gina Torres also gives everything you could ever hope for in an evil Wonder Woman performance, acting both as a bold warrior, but certainly not as noble as a princess. She has her opposite's confidence, but uses her powers a lot more frequently and freely. And for as good of a Spider-Man as he is, Josh Keaton is a pretty poor Flash. I wouldn't say it's terrible, but it does sort of feel like bargain bin Michael Rosenbaum. I also feel like he makes the character sound a little bit too youthful. A fact that's made that much more apparent when Michael Rosenbaum was recast as the character in the sequel. Even if this movie has a few overwhelmingly underwhelming performances, I think the good far outweighs the bad. This is actually one of the better Justice League movies I've ever seen, and I'm really glad I was finally able to check it out. So if you're like me and for some reason you haven't seen it yet, I highly suggest you do. So that was Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Alfred, get the Batwing ready. The Justice League is under attack. By whom? By me! Today, I'm here to talk to you about the best Justice League movie, Justice League Doom, aka Batman Screws the Justice League. There's so much that makes this movie great. For starters, the talent behind it. There's a lot of returning cast reprising their roles, with a lot of talent from the original Justice League cartoon playing their parts from the show. Kevin Conroy's back as Batman. Tim Daly as Superman. Susan Eisenberg as Wonder Woman. Carl Lubley plays Martian Manhunter. David Kaufman plays Jimmy Olsen. You also got the returning voices of Sapphire, Mirror Master, Vandal Savage, and Michael Rosenbaum returning as The Flash. If you didn't know any better, you might think this is set in the DCAU canon, but you would be WRONG! 
as not only does this movie have Hal Jordan in the Green Lantern role as opposed to Jon Stewart, but they also have Barry Allen in the role of The Flash instead of Wally West. And that's despite having Michael Rosenbaum come back to voice the character. Same mannerisms, same personality, same suit, same voice actor, same superhero mantle, different character. Because the cast is all well acquainted with their characters and used to working together, it's no shock that they're turning out fantastic performances. And it's also no surprise that there's a lot of chemistry between these characters. Outside of the Tim and Deaniverse cast, Nathan Fillion returns to the role he played the year before in Green Lantern Emerald Knights. And Green Lantern is also a role that he would continue playing for years to come. In addition to this, this is Grey Delisi's first time as Lois Lane, but it'd be far from her last, as she'd go on to play that part again in the LEGO DC movies, DC Superhero Girls, and Young Justice, as well as having other non-canonical adventures and parodies on Mad and Robot Chicken. Alfred's voice actor here would also continue voicing the character in the LEGO Batman games. My point here is that the cast are very familiar in their roles, and the fans are very familiar with them in these roles. There are other talented voice actors that I'm familiar with. Carlos Olazraki portrays Bane, and is honestly one of my favorite performances in the whole movie, while Juliet Landau has a smaller role in the beginning as Ten from the Royal Flush Gang. The plot sees Vandal Savage assemble some of the members of the Justice League's greatest foes, thus creating the Legion of Doom, the Bane of Batman's existence, Bane, the Pain in the Flash, Mirror Master, Wonder Woman's Cheetah, Green Lantern Star Sapphire, Superman's Metallo, and for Martian Manhunter, Mal- or whatever the f name is. The Bad Guy Brigade blindly serves as old Vandy Savage's henchmen, all to the tune of $100 million. They work together to strategically take down the Justice League, both physically and psychologically. And to make matters even worse, as it turns out, it's Batman who is the architect of the team's defeat. Batman is often credited as being completely unstoppable given prep time. And this is why that is. In this Bat Madman's free time, he's devised contingency plans for every member of the Justice League should they go rogue. Something the team feels fairly betrayed by. I mean, I don't think many people would take their close friend and colleague plotting their demise in their free time very well. That's not exactly something you could just brush off. Someone took my cupcake in the employee's break room? Understandable. My coworker Bruce has a murder plan specific to me should I do something he disagrees with? Significantly less understandable. What I really like about this plot is how it balances the positives and negatives of Batman. On one hand, you could say that he created these plans out of paranoia, and that wouldn't be untruthful. However, there is some justifiable method to this madness. There's some solid reasoning behind Batman doing this. When you live in a world where there are various sorts of mind control, alternate versions of oneself, and intergalactic diseases that poison the soul, the decision to have a failsafe on the strongest beings on the planet is probably a smart move. Realistically speaking, the Justice League pose more of a threat to society than any gathering of their villains, based on success rate alone. What I like about this story is that it showcases Batman's cunning and calculated nature to a fault. It actually pits Batman's wit against the Justice League themselves, Batman included. Batman now needs to outsmart himself and create contingency plans for his contingency plans. Also, he can save his friends from himself. Batman's intentions, while both noble and pure, as he's always had the best interest of those he protects, has become the cause of the team's downfall. And when Batman figures out that his plans are being used against he and his friends, just with some more critical tweaks, he feels an overwhelming sense of guilt. For the first time ever, we see Batman truly lose his cool. We see Batman panic-stricken. For a moment, he drops his stoicism and confidence. He cracks under pressure. We see his fears start to set in. Batman now needs to stop his greatest threat, himself. I like this story because it challenges Batman's actions without ever really giving a full black and white right or wrong. Because most of Batman's actions on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't exist within a black and white right or wrong. He lives in the area shaded gray. Sometimes he does unimaginable things, but he does these things for the greater good. Batman himself by nature lives in the area shaded gray. Look at all the other superheroes. They're all heroes, they're accepted as such. 
But Batman is very often referred to as a vigilante. You don't get that black and white right or wrong with Batman. There's a lot of complexities with this character. We understand his motivations and why he did what he did, but the movie doesn't come out and say if his actions are fully justifiable. Nor does it completely condemn him for what he's done. It's an answer that not even the League themselves seem to have, as this group of heroes is 50-50 on the whole ordeal. Ultimately, it's left in the hands of the viewer to decide if the ends justified the means. By time all is said and done, Batman quits the team during a trial by his peers. But he manages to leave off on good terms with Superman. The Red Blue Boy Scout asks the Dark Knight why there was a contingency plan made for everyone else on the team except for Batman himself, to which Batman responds that he does have a contingency plan. It's called the Justice League. Which I think is a really beautiful way of showing the respect and confidence he has for and with the team. And that is Justice League Doom. The movie itself is an adaptation of one of my favorite Justice League comics. And I'll admit, I don't think it perfectly captures or emulates the greatness of the book. There's some things that get a little bit lost in translation here. There's a certain unpredictable sadness that deprives the plot of hope initially. And I think the comic conveyed the danger the Justice League was in much better than the actual movie did in which that danger seems greatly suppressed. That's not to say the movie did a bad job by any means, it's just, I think the book did a better job. I just feel like the events that took place weren't as severe as they were when watching them as opposed to reading them. There were a lot of other changes that make this feel less like an adaptation and more like a movie inspired based on other material. For one, there's a lot of characters that have either been replaced or changed. Both Green Lantern and The Flash are present in both the movie and the comics, but what changes is the character in the suit. Whereas the comics had Kyle Rayner and Wally West, the movie shows Hal Jordan and Barry Allen, which is more confusing because they went out of their way to make this Flash, Barry Allen, when it was already Wally West in the book, and they already got the Wally West voice actor, and, and you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to overthink it. The problem is clearly me. I'm going to turn my brain off. Characters like Aquaman and Plastic Man, who were present in the original comic, are now replaced by Cyborg. And while it is Vandal Savage who is using Batman's own plans against him, in the comics it's actually Ra's al Ghul. And to be fair, Vandal is a pretty good replacement if you need to replace him. But you didn't need to replace him. Those characters could very easily be written to fulfill the same purpose. I'm not denying that at all. But Rage was always going to be the one that was preferred. As the demon's head isn't inserted into the story, it's Mirror Master who manages to steal Batman's contingency plans. Whereas in the comics, it's actually Talia. Of course, I don't need to tell you that Ra's al Ghul did not work with the Legion of Doom, mainly because he was too busy utilizing his own League of Assassins. Even the methods used to take the League down differ. In the comics, Superman is given a rare form of red kryptonite. This kryptonite causes him to absorb so much solar energy from the sun that it overloads his power. While in the movie, he was simply shot by a kryptonite bullet. But in the comic, it's the Flash that's hit with a special bullet. One that gives him seizures that send him into light speed. Whereas in the movie, a bomb is attached to him set to go off whenever he stops running. Green Lantern in the comic is exposed to hypnotic suggestion, which makes him believe that he's blind, thus rendering all of his powers completely useless. But in the movie, he's dosed with Scarecrow's fear toxin and given the corpse of an android. I mean, there's more to it than that. It, it works in context, but uh, the way I said it was funnier. So that's what we're going to go with. Wonder Woman is basically trapped in a virtual reality, fighting off an opponent that is her complete equal. Instead, in the movie, she's poisoned with a chemical that makes every person around her take on the appearance of her arch enemy. In the film, Martian Manhunter is poisoned with a chemical that makes him sweat magnesium, but in the comic, he's infected with nanomachines that make him sweat magnesium. Look, it's not a big change, but it is a change nonetheless. So there are a fair amount of differences between these two telling of the tales. I think you can write this off as being a very, very loose adaptation, if even that. While I don't think this movie truly matches up to the comic book it was inspired by, I do think that on its own merit, it was pretty damn good. And as of right now, it's the Justice League movie that I hold above all other Justice League movies. So if you haven't yet, read the book and watch the movie. In that order. 
I think both of them are very much worth your time. And with all that being said, if you like this video, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying... Dead Grandma. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.